everyone. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to welcome uh, you to a joint session um, on from GoFair US and uh, EarthCube. Uh, so many of you are, are attending the EarthCube uh, session as well. Um, and uh, we're happy to see all of you here. Um, so yeah, GoFair US, I just wanted to uh, start off by saying, uh, by actually sharing, um, not Zoom, uh, so, <laughs> um, but uh, in general, I, I, I wanted to share our res this resource. Our, our website um, really has uh, all of our events and other things that, that we're doing, um, but particularly the Get Involved uh, section um, is, is one place where you can learn, um, learn, learn more about some of the things we're doing. Um, I like this event right now, so the fair workflows and um, another event uh, that will be right after this um, on um, the care principles uh, for indigenous data and governance. So uh, I, I also have to back up and say we're recording um, this session. So uh, I believe all of your cameras are turned off. Um, so hopefully everyone is, is, uh, is fine with being recorded as well. Um, but uh, I also wanted to just give a brief introduction of um, uh, fair workflows. Um, so in, in uh, this sort of is, is inspired, uh, this session is inspired by um, work, uh, work I was involved with, with uh, one of the, one of the people that's presenting uh, best sheets, actually. Um, so we were working um, on a project called um, NHLBI Biodata Catalyst. And um, in, in that project, we actually work with a lot of um, fellows and, and other um, uh, people using the Biodata Catalyst. And one of the things that we were working on was um, giving guidance on uh, FAIR workflows. It became um, more and more important as we were sharing um, the, the fellows and, and the people using that platform. Uh, it, it became more and more important for them to share their workflows with others so that they could re reproduce what they were doing in, in, in their work. And um, you know, Beth and I, I, Beth was mainly working on this and I was helping review some of the work she was doing, providing this guidance, but it was a real eye opener that um, this was something we, you know, we really needed to, to, to uh, bring to the attention of, of uh, the broader community as well. And so, um, and, and to add to that too, I think that, that it was just serendipity. We um, working on another project uh, at AGU and uh, Carol Goebel, um, I reached out to her through that through one of the threads about participating in a fair workflows um, uh, you know event and and she was available and uh, Frederick as well and so um, really uh, this all came together and, and so happy to see um, um, both groups here to present and and we'll start off with actually um, Carol and Frederick so if you wanted to take over uh, the screen right now and I can uh, stop sharing. Um, and I can hand it over to you to start talking about some of the projects you're working on. Right. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and for having us here. Today we'll talk about Workflow Hub and how we work here in Europe towards fair workflows through this. Um, Workflow Hub and the EOS Life Workflow Collaboratory as a whole. Uh, I'll give the word first to Carol to kind of introduce the framework uh, of FAIR workflows. Yes, so thank you. I've just got a couple of slides here because I was, we were going first, just to get everybody onto the same page about FAIR. Of course, everybody can recite FAIR off by heart now, I'm sure. But uh, TLDR, in case you didn't notice, was uh, persistent Machine readable and actionable metadata is actually the key thing behind FAIR. Uh, persistent identifiers, clear licensing, protocols for machine accessibility, and uh, the ability to register and index uh, data originally and uh, workflows in this particular uh, case. So next slide. So I wanted also to do a bit of a computational workflows in a nutshell, because there is a whole slew of other workflows like a standard operating procedures or BPM type workflows, which we're not going to be talking about. Well, we're not going to be talking about. Dennis might be, Beth might be, but, but not us. So we're talking about computational uh, pipelines, really, and, and analytics, which are multi-step. 
that um, leverage typically leverage third party codes and uh, enable a scalable processing of data as well as transparent research and quality control over those methods. They're kind of co they're computational methods, not just processing from the point of view of execution, but also method in the sense of a record of what you've actually done. And there are a special kind of software really. And the thing I wanted to highlight here is a separation of the workflow specification from its execution. So workflow systems, and there are many, there's about 290 workflow systems that I know of, um, have a workflow uh, specification, a description of some sort, which is a precise description, including uh, the parameters, documentation, inputs and outputs, and then software execution framework. That's the workflow engine, which will interpret the description. And then the tools and codes, uh, the containers, perhaps other sub workflows that actually are then run. So there's those two aspects. And associated with that are a whole bunch of other objects data, which could be test data, input data, output data, provenance logs or analytical logs, test engines associated with that framework, other workflows, papers about it, uh, the licensing, the people who did it, and so on. So it's a quite a complicated uh, collection of, of entities that we're going to try to make fair. Frederick. Yes, so um, as we're from the European side, a little bit of context here in Europe, we of course work in the European land, uh, funding landscape and the European Open Science Cloud is an important concept where the European Commission tries to consolidate the e-infrastructure that's available and in collaboration with the scientific communities uh, that provide them the, the content and the research side, really drive open science and bring this in the kind of next era where this is available to society at large. And within life sciences specifically, where we are working, we have the EOF Life project, which aims to provide a pan-national thematic commons for bioscience data and methods. So we've been working with a lot of colleagues in Elixir and all the life science communities to curate the data and publish this into the cloud, combine this with the tools and workflows and deploy these into the cloud and the resources available here. And we've shown, sorry, we've shown this um, to be working in a variety of use cases from image analysis to drug discovery and structural bioinformatics and metagenomics. And as many know, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 monitoring is now also, of course, in scope here. To enable this, we're building on a very broad technical framework uh, supported by a, a large community globally um, I don't have the time to go into that, uh, but focusing on the workflows, we on the one hand have a whole zoo of workflow associated systems, the workflow management system that Carol mentioned, which in some cases have specific repositories uh, for their users, the containers as a backend. Within Elixir, we have a whole uh, host of registries that support finding different components from tools, containers to workflows, which is the topic for today. And we also integrate this with a number of services that allow to benchmark and test these workflows and provide additional information and analytics there. Of course, this is uh, all supported. Okay, there's a bit of a delay, but uh, this is uh, all supported by a number of um, standards and, and metadata schemas that enable us to make this uh, fair metadata and support users to um, make open science and fair data. So what did we do in the more or less uh, last year? We developed a workflow hub. This is a registry for workflows, uh, which tends to be open for all, any country, any workflow system, any discipline subject, um, we are agnostic to all of those and we want to enable finding and accessing workflows and stimulate the interoperability and reusability of these workflows. We've set this up initially in the context of COVID-19, so about one third of the workflows you will find there are related to COVID. I will go into some of the aspects that we have been working on. Um, so 
first of all, the agnostic uh, uh, aspect here. So we are working with very different um, workflow management systems from Galaxy to Nextflow to common workflow language, but also things like Jupyter Notebooks with just plain scripts are in scope. Of course, the support that we can provide or information that we can extract differs depending on the system. We want to make these workflows visible, easily accessible, and provide access to metadata such as who made these workflows and the licensing information, for example. Of course, we also support organization of your workflows in teams where you're collaborating together or spaces for larger projects and uh, collections such as what we did for the COVID-19 workflows that we provide. Important here is that the makers stay as custodians of their own workflows. Um, the attribution and the credit is really central in what we provide uh, because this is uh, essential in this whole ecosystem and where we need to go in the open science world. Of course, the development isn't finished, not at all. This is a relatively young project, uh, which will and is in perpetual development. We are uh, improving the visibility and sharing. Um, as Carol said, we want to link a lot of uh, additional data, such as documentation, test data. Uh, we want to figure out how we best can show all the connections between those workflows and track those linking to these monitoring services, for example, to provide benchmarking information and uh, assessing the quality of a workflow is important. And also, of course, the life cycle of a workflow uh, from versioning uh, snapshots and then the, the sub workflows that it is composed of. These are all topics that are high on our radar to further improve within the system, because it's really our ambition to add value and be some uh, be an added uh, resource that users can uh, leverage to make their workflows available. So, of course, we want to also stimulate the reuse of workflows. Um, this is ultimately the, the goal of what we're doing here. But Workflow Hub is uh, very solidly a registry. So inherently, we will not execute workflows uh, within the system. However, we can couple this execution to the workflow platforms that people are using. And there's different ways of doing that. Here you see uh, a collaboration with the Galaxy project where we, through the TRS API of GA4GH, have implemented um, a way that you can run a workflow available in Workflow Hub directly on usegalaxy.eu, so the European Galaxy instance. And this makes it for the user very easy to take a workflow and run it in a public, uh, publicly available uh, resource without any copying of files just with one click on the button. And in that sense, we want to expand this further and be a very generous registry. As I mentioned already, we cover a lot of different uh, types of workflows from scripts to notebooks and uh, full-fledged workflow management systems that comes with a different uh, kind of feel to it and, um, and what we can reach. So for example, for the fairness, uh, it will be a, a from a kind of base level of fairness for scripts to a very rich um, environment that uh, systems such as Galaxy or Nextflow can, can provide with a lot of added uh, information. Also for the execution of workflows, there are many diverse use cases that we want to support. We can of course just take the native uh, workflow that has been submitted, a script or a .ga file in case of Galaxy, but also the Containers are an important part where we want to provide access to containerized versions. For example, a script, you can just put in a container or same for a notebook. And a lot of the workflow systems work for the different steps that they execute with the containers uh, for each individual one. There's an additional use case here where you can package the whole thing, the whole workflow together with the workflow management system for Nextflow or for any of the other systems as one container, uh, be it in Docker or a different technology, 
and make this as a really um, a portable unit. And for example, for sensitive data, this can be important that you have something that you can just take and run on your own infrastructure. So these are the kind of things that we really want to provide added value towards the user. And we really see an opportunity here, an important role for workflows as the entry point for the community to run analysis. And we're working with a lot of projects globally to um, make this happen uh, with the workflow management systems, as uh, already mentioned. And we're building on other registries that we have available in the European Open ecosystem. So we have the Bio Tools registry that contains uh, tools and a lot of rich information on that. And uh, we are building on container registries. On the European side, we have biocontainers, but there's also, of course, DocStore, Docker Hub, etc., that we can build on to make these containers that I just mentioned available for the community. But of course, to all link this to uh, fairness, we need to have uh, much more information available on the metadata. And Carol will go through how we support that. Right, thank you. So, um, so FAIR is all about machine processable metadata. And so we have a number of different technologies that we're using for our metadata framework. We use the common workflow language as a canonical workflow description, both in its uh, form that links to containers and also an abstract form, which I'll briefly talk about in a minute. We have a, uh, a, an opinionated version of what we consider in schema.org um, under the umbrella of the bioschemas.org initiative, which is a metadata standard uh, description for um, registration and discovery of workflows, um, including formal parameter and also computational tool, which we use in all of our registries. Uh, we couple these together with the only piece which is actually bio related, which is the EDAM ontology, which is an ontology that allows us to describe the types of the inputs and outputs of the steps. But that's the only piece that's bio. All the rest is completely independent of biology. All of these then contribute to a description for a bit of ability to package together all the things that I mentioned that you needed to think about when you have a workflow into something called a workflow RO crate which is a way of being able to organize and package components and associated metadata into an assignable object. So it's a digital, a metadata digital object. And we use this throughout for reporting, exchanging, archiving, and as a carrier of metadata. And we also use it as a way of also carrying, should a workflow be run, um, the provenance um, information that we have, a couple of provenance standards that we're following. Next slide. Slowly from Belgium. Ah, there we are. Um, so um, to go into those in a little bit more detail, so we're working with workflow management systems like Galaxy, SnakeMake, uh, Nextflow, all the ones that are our favorites uh, for auto extracting metadata, uh, including abstract CWL. So this is a way of, of using the common workflow language as not just uh, as a canonical description of the workflow, even if it isn't actually the full containerized version of the workflow, which is the executable version. This is used, for example, by Galaxy that has the Galaxy workflow as its native form, but it uses CWL as a standard description. And then bioschemas, which um, uh, you can kind of see the things that we have here, which again are, are schema.org terms in order to be able to describe what we expect the workflow to be about. So one describes the workflow, one describes what the workflow um, properties about the workflow. Next slide. Um, and then the second piece is the workflow RO crate. Now this is actually a specialization of something called RO crate which is a mechanism of being able to um, aggregate files, any URI addressable content and other RO crates for that matter, along with contextual information into these um, packages called um, crates. Um, and each of these have their own metadata uh, and identify. This is something that's been going on for quite a long time. It's been extensively used. It's very developer friendly. So it uses native web stuff, um, JSON, LD and schema.org and baggage and things like this. It has self-describing properties, so it's very open-ended and it's typed by profiles. So you just describe what you want to expect to be there and add more schema.org or domain ontologies as you seem fit. And it, anything can be referenceable from it. So we use identifiers and, and metadata alongside um, heterogeneous data in order to be able to bag up 
uh, lots of, of references, as it were. And it's infrastructure independent, which makes it really good for exchanging between repositories and registries and services. So it's just what we needed. And so it's what we have. Next slide. Uh, and an aside, aside for all you earth science people out there, um, RO Crate is also being used in earth sciences and uh, by the Reliance Project in the European Open Science Cloud as a way of being able to describe their uh, data cubes uh, collections. But that's not for more discussion here. That was just a taster for you earth people. Back to workflows. Um, so we have a, a profile for workflows for this RO Crate, which says what we expect to see uh, collected together. So we expect to see a metadata pile uh, that describes the content and the content can, for example, include a Galaxy uh, file, which describes Galaxy workflow, directory of a common workflow language files, links to uh, different resources, links to GitHub, link to data and so on. So we can use all of this to bundle together uh, all the objects that we need and all the descriptions and uh, and Basically, it's a collection of references, files, and directories, and we use it for all sorts of things, including citation, which we're talking with Chris and Shelley about. Of course, the profiles are described through uh, Bioschema and, uh, and, um, uh, and CWL. So we use this throughout. So if we kind of look at uh, our little um, uh, set of services, we've got things that are executing and running, things that we're registering, and things that we're um, testing and monitoring. And uh, we're using RO Crate across all of these. So the workflows send up RO Crates into the registry as well as through GitHub or through just files. Uh, we enrich those um, RO Crates on the registry so that we can then ship them out again to other uh, resources like Zenodo or Dataverse um, to archive them. Uh, and we can en enrich them. Whoop, I think you've gone the wrong way, Frederick. Next slide. Next slide, Frederick. <laughs> it's a long way in Belgium. There we are. Uh, perhaps the next one. Where's the next button? Yay, there we go. And uh, so we have, um, and we kind of have uh, variations of these um, RO crates, enough information to do the testing, for example, or the results of a run. And so these, uh, these crates become added to and extended and enriched as they get fairer. So we're kind of turning the workflow hub into a sort of RO crate factory. So now I want to final, uh, finish up with, if, if the slides will go fast enough, uh, on um, FAIR, how all this fits in with FAIR. Well, FAIR workflows are actually processual uh, digital objects, which means that they have properties of both data and software. So you probably got the idea now that they're composite, so one has to worry about FAIR all the way down. Um, they're actual things that you can remix because you can take bits of workflow and mix them with other bits of workflow. Um, and they also version just because they are software kind of art artifacts. So you can mix them up and you can version them. So they are mixable and evolvable, with, but they have limited lifespans. They have agency because they're software, so they call other things that may or may not be fair. Uh, it's important that they're usable, not just reusable, and I'll go into a brief a description about why that's slightly different and they have different forms so the specification might be fair but the implementation instantiation of it in a particular workflow system may not be so there's uh, various different variations of what we mean so they're basically not just um uh, you could treat them like their data objects, like method objects, and you can adapt the FAIR principles as a result, but they're also software, and there the principles have to be significantly revised. And things like the RDA um, uh, are developing that. So one of the things, of course, as their software, is that if, once you've registered them, you want to maybe unfold them to what, identify sub-workflows and lift them up. Uh, you want to version them, you want to publish them, and so on. So next slide. So we have to be able to support all of these different kinds in, of things. So we have indicators of the status of them. You can register different versions. Uh, you can keep adding incremental metadata and supplement materials. You can give them DOIs. We do monitoring and so on. And one of the things we really want to do is tracking and lifting out uh, and following workflows as they move between different workflow systems. Next slide. So, the, uh, so to finish off, because I can see Chris there, Sorry, we've had a bit of delays from Belgium, Chris, uh, that um, we have um, the notion of, of, of where does this fit in with FAIR? Well, is findable, 
yep, I think you can kind of get the idea of that. Um, things are findable. We're pretty fair because we have identifiers. We have self-describing metadata. I think we got that across. And we also do the usual sorts of things, fast to browsing and so on. Next. Um, are we accessible from Workflow Hub? Well, yeah, but next, next big tick. Uh, so you can get, again, the archive is important. Uh, yeah, our archive, archive is important. So you can retrieve all the metadata because it's all sitting there and we have open protocols. The up back, the next, uh, you're too fast, uh, Frederick. It's a remote control thing, right. But uh, the, the thing that's really interesting here is Metadata accessible even when the workflow is no longer available. Now that is important in FAIR. And there, the RO crate is an archive that preserves all the metadata and the workflow, even if the workflow disappears. And what's more, even if Workflow Hub disappears, we can preserve the entire thing because we can archive that RO crate into another archive, for example, like Zenodo. Next slide. Um, interoperability is always tricky because nobody ever understands it. What does it mean to have uh, in interoperable software, interoperable workflows? And uh, on the left are, are the extensions of the normal FAIR principles. And on the right are the actual interoperable FAIR principles from software as opposed to um, the normal FAIR principles. Next slide. Next. Okay, so um, from the point of view of all of the metadata um, that we would normally accept, okay, we've, we've already heard about that. We have an extensive metadata framework, which we which use for more languages, vocabularies, and so on. Um, and of course, we also have um, extensive references to other things. And I think that's also important that we, we can reference um, all sorts of things, GitHub entries, people, um, the testing environments, and so on. Next. And then reusability is the last one, of course. Um, can it be reusable? That is, can it be understood, modified, built upon and incorporated into other workflows? And of course, our workflows are, track, are described in detail. Are we track versions explicitly? Not everybody uses GitHub. So we also do versioning within the uh, workflow hub. Um, but how to design for reuse and produce canonical workflows is proving to be interesting. And there are some interesting projects already around that. Can it be usable is a different thing. That's can it be executed? And there we are relying on um, integration with execution platforms, including a big platform uh, that we're building in Elixir. Um, and we also do a lot of testing and monitoring. Uh, next slide. Uh, the thing that we aren't touching here is verification of workflows, which is data fair for and from workflows. So how do we indicate how a work, does a workflow follow data fair principles? So that means things like, does the workflow use proprietary formats? Uh, are the parameters validated? And what are the usage restrictions on the reference data? So the actual, this is, this is not the fairness of the workflows. This is the fairness, the workflows behaving as fair uh, data producing objects. And that is uh, a topic that we're not going to discuss here, but it's a very interesting topic in order to be able to highlight and requires practical guidelines, uh, a peer review and uh, building certified libraries in order to be able to do that. Next slide. So this is a conclusion, Chris, um, which is uh, workflows are uh, both data and software objects. Um, verification of workflows, I think, is an interesting topic that really hasn't been properly addressed yet. And it takes a village, just like all things in FAIR, um, of services, workflow management systems, repositories, people all working together to really interface with this lightweight uh, metadata framework and to enable metadata collection and enrichment, which is the thing that drives FAIR. And really, not one size does not fit all because we're working with scripts to fully fledged systems uh, not all of which use GitHub or containers. Uh, so it is a bit of a spectrum. So um, thank you for your tolerance, Chris, for our slow clicking. Well, there was a comment about that, <laughs> whether Belgium lost in Euro 2021. <laughs> that's why it's slow. So maybe. Oh, could be. I didn't know that. Can... <laughs> oh, there you go. They're probably really, um, you know, on a go slow now. <laughs> but. <laughs> um, it's very interesting. So there's also um, Shelly was um, sharing, uh, Shelly Stahl, a colleague I, I, who I work with at AGU was sharing the 
recent uh, RDA um, group's recommendation, the, the FAIR software principles. And I think that was really great that you mentioned that with workflows, you're, you're working across data and software. So that's, that's an even greater challenge. But um, yes. I'll wait for some other questions to come through here. But I, I asked you some initial questions uh, up, up if you can see them in the chat. But one of them was um, Whittle. Um, was another oh, yes. language that uh, we were using um, in the Biodata Catalyst. And I don't know if you're also accommodating that language as well. Um, so yeah, we know about Widdle, of course, um, but we just, we decided particularly because because we did this quite quickly, Chris. <laughs> we, we, we stood this up very quick in order and, and got this going because we really had a very strong driver in order to be able to deal with COVID, actually. So about a third of our workflows in this platform are COVID monitoring, variant calling, and so on. So, um, so we picked on uh, the common workflow language. We have a lot of um, experience with it and uh, quite a lot of, um, a lot of people in Europe use it. So, um, so that was our, our pick. Now we, that we have nothing in our framework that means that we only need to use one um, weather language. We could use Woodle too, but uh, we're, it, it's, it's more to do with uh, focus and resources, nothing to do with technology. So, um, so that's where we, that's why we chose CWL at this point. Yeah, that was a converting between those two languages uh, was was one of the things that came up, um, you know, sometimes in but so uh, the other thing was, uh, sometimes it's good, you mentioned uh, that you've gotten a lot of workflows um, on your on to yes. system. Um, and, and sometimes it's really great to see some examples of how people leveraged, uh, yes. you know, leverage this. And so I, I don't know if you can, um, you know, include a link to your, your favorite or <laughs> <laughs> or or one one or two of them uh, so that we can uh, okay. you know can see we some can also things. include links to the ones where we think you really should have done your metadata better than this <laughs> uh, which, uh, uh, which is which is one one of the things that is um, of course really challenging is um, you know I'm, and I'm sure um, Beth and and Dennis have the same issue is getting people to uh, to be able to write good metadata is really tricky. Um, so, uh, so, um, uh, and kind of one of the things that we're trying to do with the visibility, as it were, is show people this is really good um, um, uh, description, this is good metadata, and this one isn't so good. Um, so, uh, to try to create that momentum, but I'll go and dig, we'll go and dig through the workflow hub, and while uh, Beth and, and, and Dennis are talking, because I don't want to take any time out from them, we'll post one, uh, one or two in the oh, that's that's yeah. good. So Christian yeah. says, yes, please. <laughs> the good and the bad. <laughs> bad examples. Uh, <laughs> shame. <laughs> We've been working with like, workflow management system champions that then uh, provide us some good example of kind of what the possibilities are so we can point to those. Uh, but yes. at this point, you kind of need to know who these people are to uh, easily identify them. But yeah, that's indeed a good point. Yeah. All right. That's great. Uh, so also uh, one more is that you know, like getting started, uh, you know, where, where you can sort of dive in and, and uh, get started with using your, um, you, you know, your platform, but also like how learning about workflows, if, if you have a, a place where people can start a link or, or, or two that you can share as well that, um, but I haven't seen other questions from or comments. So um, I think the, so if you wanted to share those uh, in the chat and, um, if people have uh, follow-up questions uh, or comments, please uh, um, add them to the chat. And I think Car so, Carol, you'll you'll be hanging around, and uh, and and Frederick, yeah, okay. Yeah, so. we want to hear what uh, Dennis and Beth have got to say. Okay, I mean, all right. We, so we, we know their their platform really well. We've even used it. <laughs> <laughs> We're um, fans. <laughs> yeah, I saw the link to it in your in your work and in, in your diagrams. Uh, so yeah, without uh, further ado, uh, Dennis and Beth, if you wanted to uh, take over here and uh, and start your presentation. Uh, Dennis, you're muted. I, I just saw that you were muted. So you're just getting set up. Okay. Um, cool. Is is that visible to everyone? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll be presenting for DocStore. Um, on DocStore, on behalf of the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, and I'm joined by Beth Sheets from the University of California, 
Santa Cruz Genomics Institute. Um, so sort of talking about the things that we'll be um, covering in this talk, we'll be talking about um, what is DocStore and how did it come about. We'll talk about some of the features that DocStore has accumulated over the years and how we think that relates to FAIR. We'll be talking about a best practices document that we're working on um, that brings together some of the tutorials and some of the documentation that we've accumulated um, on how to work with workflows. And then Beth will be presenting on some of the prominent work uh, on DocStore with a bit of a focus on how we think that relates to FAIR. And then a bit of a sneak peek as to future work that we're doing on DocStore in the near future. So what is DocStore? So DocStore uh, is an open source platform for sharing tools and workflows as well. Um, it's a registry for uh, workflows initially based on um, the languages CWL and Whittle. And over the years, we've expanded and included workflow languages such as Nextflow and Galaxy. Um, we came at this from the perspective of um, software developers based within bioinformatics. Uh, so we were initially working uh, to figure out how to run workflows in a variety of different environments that support uh, Docker um, to make it interoperable because we knew we wouldn't be able to handle all the problems. Uh, so we wanted to basically try to at least have a window into how to standardize this sort of idea through those aforementioned Global Alliance for Genomics and Health APIs. Um, and we wanted to make things reproducible. So at the time we founded DocStore, it wasn't entirely obvious if workflows would always run exactly the same way in every different environment. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that things were reproducible. These aren't exactly fair concepts, um, but over the years, as we've expanded DocStore and worked on it, um, we've accumulated a few features that we think do fit into this ecosystem. We're currently on version 1.10, and we've previously or first presented version 1.2.5 at BOSC uh, 2017. That's the Power Informatics Open Source Conference. Um, and yeah, I'll be sharing the slides in the chat afterwards. Um, oh, and I think that's just a sneak peek as to, um, this is our current site, and we're working on a site with more documentation and more explanation as to um, how to use DocStore. So just to sort of elaborate on it, we're coming from the bioinformatics world. And the idea is that back in 2016, um, we were cloud shepherds. Um, that, that was our term for people that needed, were assigned the task of running workflows across a bunch of different environments around the world. We would be logging into places um, that were based on OpenStack or based on um, HPC environments or based on commercial clouds such as AWS or Azure. And we would be tasked with running the same workflows across those different environments and getting them to run the same way. It, didn't, um, it wasn't immediately obvious how we would do that at the time. So we found a Docster um, to standardize how to run workflows across those different environments. So, what is DocStore? Well, it's open source. So we can go to GitHub and take a look at our source code. And um, there are many like issues that you can look into. And we also have a public API that you can look into, but more, in, more probably relevant to an end user. Um, we basically focus on workflows that reach out to Docker containers to describe the dependencies that are used by those different uh, workflows and we're compatible with CWL, Whittle, Nextflow, and Galaxy. Um, what does it mean for DocStore to support a particular workflow language? There's a link in these slides to the language support table. Um, the brief summary is that um, for a workflow to be supported in DocStore, we basically do a bit of work in order to be able to validate that your workflow um, is sane so that it basically has uh, some of the basic building blocks that we expect to see in those languages and isn't, say, in um, a completely different file format. Um, we're able to do a bit of syntax highlighting. We're able to do a bit of visualization, depending on a language, uh, from a lesser or a fuller extent. Um, we also uh, include links to some additional visualization options from places like view.com and wl.org or the EPAM. Whittle Viewer, which are external projects 
that we've integrated into DocStore to help visualize some of these workflows. Um, all these examples have links out from DocStore, which I'll be talking about later, um, describing how to run those workflows. And we are also able to do a certain amount of metadata parsing. So parsing out um, authorship, contact info, description. Uh, specifically for CWL, we have the capability of parsing out input and output file types um, and to parse out references to Docker images. Okay, so how to get workflows onto Doc stores. So we have a number of getting started guides for each of those different languages. Um, in brief, there's a few different ways of getting workflows into DocStore. You typically put your workflows onto a source control platform such as GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket. Those will point to a Docker image on a Docker registry. And then um, you, register your doc, you register your workflow onto DocStore. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. You can either do it manually or you can do it with GitHub apps. GitHub apps is a our current recommendation for getting um, workflows onto DocStore. And there's a guide here um, that will help you uh, work with that. And I'm gonna do a, something a little bit risky here, which is to sort of in the background do a bit of a live demo. So the way you would get workflows onto DocStore um, is you say you have a workflow and it's in this like, particular example is in Whittle. What you can do is you can edit it a bit. Imagine that I'm doing something sensical here, um, but what I'm actually gonna do is just gonna be changing this guest offer to another number of that guest author. Note that in this case, I'm committing to the master branch, which is something that we'll be covering a bit in our best practices document later. Um, and I'm going to be making a release of that. So say like a 1.4 version of the workflow. I'm gonna let that grind a bit in the background. Um, so we have workshop tutorials um, on the docs.docstore.org site. You can go look at some of our older posters and talks. And we have a number of YouTube tutorials uh, covering things like how to work with Docker and how to work with CWL or Whittle. Um, and then get those workflows onto DocStore. So what is it like running workflows from DocStore? Um, we basically have a CLI that helps walk through how to run CWL and Words Whittle workflows locally for development purposes. They basically help you work through the process of installing CWL tool or Cromwell in order to play around with those workflows locally. We know that's typically not how you would run those workflows um, in production, in a um, real production environment. Uh, so we also provide links that help you look for some partners that can help run your workflows at scale. Um, there's a link there that talks about all the different partners, but we are currently linking out to places like Terra, BD Catalyst, TNA Stack, Anvil, or Seven Bridges. And you click through to launch with partners, sort of like how you would click through to hotels on Google Maps or TripAdvisor when we used to travel. Um, so just here's a bit of a demo link. Um, so the idea is that you would try to find a particular workflow on DocStore. You maybe try to find a specific version of that workflow that you're interested in. You would click through to that particular version. You find out which particular uh, workflow platform you're interested in launching out to. And then that will bring you into that platform. It will import a particular version of a workflow, give you a chance to look at whether what you imported was correct. And then in that platform, it kind of depends on their processes, how you would link it up to a particular space to execute that workflow or generally run that workflow multiple times. So going back to DocStore and going back one slide. So ideally, you would click on a particular version of the workflow and you would see, hey, this version has started showing up into DocStore with a particular author that we sort of did as a um, hello world. And this is how it'd show up in DocStore. So moving on.
Well, we've sort of approached this from a developer point of view to help developers run workflows in a reproducible and portable way. Nonetheless, we've accumulated a few features over the years that we help believe help with FAIR, and we welcome suggestions for new ones in our GitHub issues um, in the forum or I believe in next week's panel discussion. Um, and we also ran into the uh, FAIR for us uh, suggestions for research software. Um, so thinking about some of the ways that we work with DocStore, so for example, um, workflows are versioned on DocStore and it's usually based on where we got them from. So if a workflow was imported from GitHub, it would show up in the URL and in a particular version of that. We have a faceted search that you can go to, but we're a little bit short on time, so maybe not today. Um, but you can basically search through metadata harvested on descriptors. You can look at a free text search or search based on UI configurable labels. So authors um, in Boxster have the ability to label their workflows similar to what you would expect on GitHub. Um, you also have organizations and collections. These are a bit similar to channels or playlists that you've encountered. The basic idea is that you can not only organize and collect your own workflows that you want to show off or say um, a particular funding agency own those particular workflows, but you can also collect and vouch for workflows that other people have created um, and sort of say, hey, my lab uses this workflow that we found really useful from someone else. We also do DOI export, and I'll talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, just to sort of give a preview as to what organizations and collections look like on DocStore, you basically have a bit of uh, space to describe your organization using Markdown and describe both your organization as a whole or particular collections of workflows. And if your profiles are linked to ORCID, you have the ability to show that off on your profile and say, hey, um, these particular maintainers of that organization have an ORCID profile and have previously worked on um, these other papers or these other workflows. Um, going forward, features that help with FAIR. So the accessible, um, so we basically have support for the GA for GH tools registry schema, version one, version two beta, and version two final um, of that particular standard. Published workflows are always accessible without logging in, and they always link back to source control. DocStore stores a version of the workflow that can be shared with others in case that source control went down. And in case we go down, then you can also snapshot workflows on DocStore and export them to Zenodo to mint DOIs. Um, and a full copy of your workflows will be available there as well. Um, so we've mentioned this a few times before in both presentations of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. We um, worked with that group, specifically the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health uh, Cloud Workstream to develop the tool registry standard. Uh, this uh, standardizes how to describe containerized workflows and workflows that use multiple tools wrapped in descriptor languages. Uh, that standard is currently on the version two and we're working on a version 2.0.1. And that is implemented by DocStore and BioContainers, which was uh, previously mentioned in the last presentation as well. Um, so just to sort of reiterate, DocStore implements TERS. We provide a standardized subset of uh, TERS, which is used by launch with partners to run workflows. We also extend that API with experimental or extended functionality to do things like authenticated access for authors, um, to do things like organized communities, to do things like verification. Um, so some features that we think help out with the interoperableness. Um, we have the ability to register JSON parameter files. So all four of the workflow languages that we use have a concept of JSON parameter files. These allow you to describe the input parameters for a workflow and point at test data. We normally recommend that uh, workflow developers point their test data at open access data sets so that users have the ability to test and try out a workflow. Um, 
beforehand to see that it works um, as is before hooking up their own data. We also have the concept of checker workflows, and this was used as part of the GA for GH Dream challenge. This was a challenge where we were explicitly testing whether workflows would be portable across different environments. The idea is that you could have a workflow that tests the output of a legitimate workflow to see, hey, did it run correctly in a completely new environment? And so I'm going to hand it off to Beth to continue on from the uh, reusable. Thanks, Dennis. Um, so features on DocStore that help with um, the reusableness of a workflow is really well covered in a new document um, titled Best Practices for Secure and Fair Workflows. Um, this document also goes into some um, suggested practices to um, uh, develop containers and think about ways to, to do that and, and make uh, the container more secure because a lot of our end users are working with uh, controlled access data. Um, and it also goes into detail a little bit more with the um, findable, accessible, and interoperable practices that Dennis pointed to. For the reusable section, um, it goes into detail about um, how to reference an immutable version of your container to ensure that the workflow is reusable, suggestions to include in a readme. Um, so this is again from the end user perspective to make your workflow something that the user community understands. And so we have some sections pointed, um, sections in there that can um, help you fill that out. There's examples on licensing um, to include with your workflow. And there's also um, how to set up your workflow for citation. And I can show that a little more in the next slide. Um, and this was developed in partnership with an HLBI um, Biodata Catalyst, which is a cloud compute ecosystem um, that we interoperate with. And there will be more features coming um, around fairness from, from that uh, collaboration. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So I just wanted to showcase some really nice work that our community has added to DocStore um, and give you a, a sense of, of what you could do like, with your own work. So this highlights a little bit of our organizations and collections feature. So the Broad Institute has an organization um, listed within DocStore and they have a viral genomics collection, which is um, a lot of COVID-19 analyses. Um, and if you don't mind clicking on the collection, I can just show you a little bit of what that looks like. Um, so you can see there's several workflows here and they have a really nice readme describing um, what these workflows are, um, you know, what order you use them in. If you scroll down a little bit, the thing I really liked about this submission is that they have example tutorials using the cloud compute environment called Terra. Um, and so you can go there and find test data and um, example inputs and example outputs that they've already run and really um, get a, a nice understanding of, of potentially how to reuse these workflows. Um, if you could go back to the slide deck. Another thing I wanted to point out is that the workflows that are highlighted in this tutorial that was just showcased and in this collection um, were part of a paper that was published in Science looking at uh, COVID-19 um, uh, viral genomes and um, where those uh, viruses were coming from using phylogenetics. And they um, minted DOIs for all of the workflows that they used in that analysis. And in that um, science paper in their methods section, they cite um, each workflow by the DOI. So if you, um, you don't need to click on the science paper now, but it's a nice thing to look at if you look at our slide pack later. Um, another cool organization is called NF Core. And uh, the thing I wanted to highlight there, they contribute Nextflow workflows to DocStore. And if you click on the guidelines for workflow developers, um, these are really cool things, again, that the community is providing for workflow authors. And uh, the things I really like that they do are they give um, example templates to start from when working on your workflow and um, minimum requirements for submitting a workflow um, through their organization. So again, it's just a really cool uh, resource to look at. Um, we could go back to the slide deck, so we're limited on time. And another thing I wanted to highlight is um, a collection coming from NHLBI Biodata Catalyst. Again, this is a cloud compute ecosystem. Um, and these researchers are working on really large data um, that um, is submitted through NHLBI, which is the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in the United States. 
and they have petabytes of genomic data paired with phenotypic data. And so an analysis that they're really interested in is genome-wide association studies. So this is a collection that they've provided, um, if you don't mind clicking on it, Dennis. And um, again, uh, this is using the workflow description language and Terra as the compute environment for this example. And there's, again, tutorials that show you exactly um, how to uh, run these workflows and include Jupyter notebooks that tell you how to um, create the complex input files that you might use for these workflows. And the really cool thing is um, these cloud cost examples. So as researchers move to the cloud, it's a different way of um, considering cost of your research. And cloud costs are one of the things that I think keep people from, from trying out the cloud. So I thought it was really nice that these cloud costs examples were provided uh, for end users that might use this workflow. Um, you could go back. Um, so next slide. I think that wraps up our talk. Uh, we wanted to point you to some further reading. We just had a paper um, published in Nucleic Acids Research that describes um, DocStore and our current features and a little bit about where we're interested in going. Uh, we wanted to give a link to our documentation repo um, for you to check out. It includes a lot of tutorials. We're continually adding to those tutorials. And one of the pieces of feedback we've gotten is, is trying to offer more um, complex examples. So that's on the roadmap. And we wanted you to keep an eye out for our release of 1.11, which includes some updates to our UI to make it more user-friendly. We got a preview earlier from Dennis. Uh, we now support Galaxy workflows. So there's a Galaxy launch with button where you can um, uh, send a Galaxy workflow from DocStore into a Galaxy compute environment. There's some updates to our um, integration with GitHub apps that Dennis demoed, including better control for publishing and branches. And then behind the scenes, we've been doing a lot of work to make the DocStore product more secure. So we're currently going through a US compliance standard called FedRAMP, uh, which is really important for our NIH partners as we integrate more with these ecosystems that host very sensitive data and also with um, AWS CIS. And um, yeah, we can move forward. And just, I want, Dennis and I want to thank the rest of the team who couldn't um, make the DocStore product without them. Um, they're highlighted here. And lastly, we always want to thank our funders for making DocStore possible. And I can wrap up. I know we only have a few minutes left for questions. Well, thank, you, thank you, Dennis. Yeah, Beth, uh, there's one question. Maybe you can answer one uh, at least uh, that says, uh, can you comment on sustainability of DocStore? Um, sounds somewhat similar to what BioDocker um, was aiming to do, but was not sustained. Also, how does it relate to bio containers? I think you did answer that briefly, but, and, and thanks. So that, that was one of the questions. Yeah, I can probably speak to um, at least half of that. So um, if I recall correctly, bio containers was focused more on um, generating and processing the actual um, Docker containers slash images. Um, we're sort of focused a little bit more on the workflows and workflow descriptor side of things. We are developing features to help um, archive and um, record like things like digests or uh, checksums for your Docker images in DocStore, but we don't necessarily anticipate storing the actual Docker images on DocStore itself, although we may assist in the future with exporting those or helping you archive them. Um, speaking to sustainability in the other sense of the word, I guess if that was um, a reference like to, to the fact that we're sort of based on grants. Well, we, we are focused on, we are sustained by grants on both the UC, um, like the American side and YCR um, uh, Canadian side. And I guess the best we can say is both institutions are very enthusiastic about the project, but ultimately we are dependent on grants in those two countries. Uh, thanks. And, and there's a, I had a question about data management plans. Have you, um, have you had conversations about uh, workflows used in data management plans? I know we're hoping that those become more dynamic <laughs> and, and also more machine readable and they actually are more robust and respond, uh, you know, like as, because researchers are constantly, you know, changing their, their projects. So I don't know if you've had conversations around um, data management plans as well, um, the use of workflows. 
I don't know exactly um, the question that you're asking, but I will say that uh, we are working on an accreditation feature where an organization could accredit, uh, like review a, a workflow and accredit that workflow. And then um, that workflow would be kind of given a thumbs up from say the organization is um, an NIH organization and really cares about how you're using certain workflows with um, controlled access data. And so you would be able to pair um, like high quality reviewed accredited workflows with um, specific data sets when you're requesting for access to analyze those data sets. Does that help answer the question or was it? Uh, well, no, it's, it was a great answer. <laughs> but I, I think there, yeah, there, that can go, we can go down the hole with maybe uh, data management plans. But uh, so uh, I know that we're on edge with uh, another presentation that's coming up, uh, the CARE session. So um, I just wanted to thank um, all of you for, um, you know, giving these great presentations. And I think it's really great to see how this can be extended to other disciplines, other communities. Um, you know, I, I know I'm very interested and I talk to my colleague Shelly Stahl all the time at AGU about, about all of your work, about, you know, how, how we, because I see the same challenges in earth and space sciences and maybe we could also apply this as well. So thank you, um, all of you. Um, thank you, Carol and Frederick for staying up very late. And uh, um, we'll, we'll be moving over to the, to the other session, the CARE principles. So thanks, thanks everyone.